The Japanese lunar lander is presumed lost after flight controllers were unable to make contact with the spacecraft as it attempted to land. Let's bring in live now Fred Watson, Australia's astronomer at large. Fred, good to see you. Thanks for your time. What went wrong with this mission, do we know? We don't know what went wrong, uh, and it was something that happened right at the very end of the spacecraft's flight as it was uh, descending towards the lunar surface. The telemetry coming back to the mission controllers said that everything was going fine, uh, that the spacecraft was descending, and then the rate of descent increased suddenly, uh, and then they lost contact. And that suggests what is euphemistically called a hard landing. In other words, it crashed onto the lunar surface, which is a great shame. This is a, a, a very brave attempt to send a, a robotic spacecraft funded by private agencies rather than a, a public concern like NASA or JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency. And so what would then happen to that spacecraft? Does it burn up? Does it continue floating around space? What happens next to it? So, so it is almost certainly in, I would guess, quite small pieces on the surface of the moon. Uh, the moon doesn't have an atmosphere and so it can't burn up on the way in like things do when they uh, enter the Earth's atmosphere or re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Um, so it would be a hard landing. Um, I'm assuming, you know, from what I've read, that what happened was that the propulsion system failed. Perhaps uh, by propulsion, I mean the braking rockets that are slowing it down so that it, it makes a soft landing on the surface. Uh, if that happens, then you've just got the moon's gravity, albeit only one sixth of the Earth's gravity, but it's still enough to pull something down uh, and a spacecraft like that would, uh, it, it wouldn't uh, explode. Uh, it is very unlikely it would explode, but it would certainly be damaged beyond repair. There might be a debris pile. It is possible that uh, a NASA spacecraft which orbits the moon, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, might eventually pick up the pieces, and by that I mean detect them rather than go down and get them, uh, to detect the pieces uh, as has happened before with previous uh, landings on the moon. Uh, so uh, that's something that we might find out more about uh, down the track. I see it's been a big week in space news. Scientists have for the first time detected seismic waves through the core of Mars. Now, what does that actually mean? Why is it significant? Well, it's uh, the way we probe the interior of the Earth is, and it's been done for more than 100 years, is to look at the way earthquakes uh, are transmitted through the central regions of the Earth. That's how we know that the Earth has a, a solid and a liquid metal core. Uh, now, there is a spacecraft on Mars. It's now been switched off uh, as of December last year. It's called InSight, and its job was to measure seismic waves uh, traveling through the, uh, the, the, the body of Mars, through the under surface. Uh, and uh, some recent analysis uh, done by scientists at the University of Maryland and elsewhere has shown that uh, we can now track these seismic waves through the core of Mars, uh, the central core, which, as I said, on Earth is a mixture of solid and liquid iron. It turns out that Mars's core is liquid, uh, so it's molten. Uh, it does not have a central uh, uh, solid core like the uh, like the Earth does, uh, and its composition is quite different. The Earth's core is uh, nickel and iron, mostly iron. Uh, now Mars's core seems to have a high percentage of some quite unusual elements, most notably sulphur and oxygen, which are much lighter than iron, and so they make up a apparently something like 20% of the core of Mars. And what that suggests is that Mars may have had a very different story to tell when it comes to its origins, the way pla planets were formed. We tend to assume rocky planets like the Earth and Mars all formed the same way. But given this difference in their central composition, maybe that is not the case. OK, we also have a new image of a black hole. We'll show this picture to our viewers now, and I might just get you to explain, Fred, exactly what it is that we're looking at here. <laughs> OK, so this is a, a, a black hole at the centre of a galaxy. It is a supermassive black hole, uh, many, um, in fact, billion times the mass of our sun. Uh, and uh, we know that galaxies do have these supermassive black holes at the centre. This one's particularly important. It's a galaxy that rejoices in the glamorous name of M87. Uh, it has been well studied by, uh, uh, by ground-based radio telescopes in the past. And so we have seen an image already 
of the black hole at the center of M87. What we've seen now, uh, and uh, perhaps I um, could concentrate on the, on the center of the image that you were just showing, is the way that black hole relates to the jet of material that it's spitting out. Uh, this is only detectable by very large arrays of radio telescopes spread all over the Earth. So you've effectively got a telescope the size of our planet uh, to look at these things and see the detail that is emerging. We know that uh, black holes like this do spit out material, not from the black hole itself, but from the disk of debris around it uh, at very high speeds. And what this new image shows is just how that connects to the black hole itself, how the black hole organizes that what's called an accretion disk of debris around it, focuses it into a jet and then spits that jet out at speeds almost the speed of light. Very exciting astronomy. Very exciting indeed, Red Watson. We've all learned something there in the last few minutes. I think really appreciate you joining us to explain all of that. Oh, Thank you. Always a pleasure. Many thanks.